Good evening, everybody. It's time for us to get started. Uh, got a few announcements I want to make before we do get started. Uh, tonight in our service, uh, David Beggarly will be leading our singing. I'll have the first prayer, and Joe Kennedy will have our closing prayer. And uh, it's good to see everybody out tonight. I know it's cold and dark out there, but hey, it's cold and dark at home too, so might as well be here. Uh, Dale Moser, this is the father of Terry Moser's recovering from broken leg. Gene and Georgia Owens both are still having problems with uh, uh, Georgia's having problems with her eye, and then Gene is having problems with blood pressure and uh, blood sugar and heart and heart blood pressure. Uh, Nicole, anybody talked to Nicole lately? Can, can, can you not hear me? Uh, huh? Still can't? <laughs> okay, Nicole, Nicole Eskew, uh, or Druin, or whatever her name is, she's she's got the flu, and uh, with Chad at home, and Jenny Cruz also has got the flu, and Kenneth Lawrence, he's doing better. He's with us tonight, and that's good a good a good thing for that. Tex Mitchell's back with us. He uh, he's doing fine. He said he felt good. Sue Collins is in the hospital. I got a bladder infection, dehydration. She's still in the hospital. She is at home. Okay. Uh, Jean Garrett. This is uh, Diana Brandon. Passed away last week in that visitation, and the funeral is tomorrow. Visitation from 9 to 11, then the funeral following it at the uh, Hermitage Memorial Gardens. Peggy Cantrell is out with the flu. She wouldn't hear Sunday, and she is doing some better, though. Uh, Kathy, uh, my wife, she has got to go to... Uh, uh, when? December 1st. She's got to go to a surgeon December the 1st to see what they can do with this pain in her, uh, her shoulder. Mark LaRocco is having angiograms on both his legs Monday. He's having a lot of problems with uh, his legs going to sleep and not being able to walk and stuff. And Carla gave me a, 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 a note here. Let me see. Black-eyed peas, ham. <laughs> No, this is Carla's aunt. Aileen Willoughby passed away this afternoon following a lengthy illness. Her funeral will be in northern Kentucky on Sunday. Please remember her family in your prayers. She has a husband, three daughters, one son, and many grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Also, Carla's cousin, Keith, was admitted back into the hospital in San Antonio with fluid around his abdomen, his heart, and he's scheduled to have chemo and radiation soon, so he's still fighting his cancer, so please keep this family and also Car uh, Carla's cousin Keith in her prayers also. Does anybody else have anything? Mr. Singles group meets this Friday at 6 o'clock downstairs. Thanksgiving baskets, don't forget to be here Saturday morning at 10 o'clock to, to uh, stuff uh, Thanksgiving baskets for all of our shut-ins and all of those who are sick and not able to get out. Is there anything else they need to do, uh, Juanita, you know of? Everything's taken care of, okay. So just come and bring your hands. And uh, Kathy, you can stay at home. Your arm's bad. <laughs> No, come come and help us stuff those baskets, and and we'll deliver them to the people. Also, Saturday, if if you've got any on your way home or whatever. Anybody else got any announcements? All right, bow with me. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're so thankful again for our health and the ability that we have together here to worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you. Father, for all of those who got out this afternoon, and we 
we join together in spirit to give you thanks for all things in our life and to hear another message from thy word. We pray that you will open our hearts and our minds. <clears throat> Help us to receive it with thanksgiving and find ways that we can use it in our everyday life to serve you and our fellow man. Be with all those I mentioned here sick, Father, those who have uh, heart problems, those who are going in for tests. Also, Father, for those who have lost loved ones, we pray that your blessings be upon them. Pray that we as Christians and brothers and sisters will comfort them in this time of their need. Be with us tonight. Be with Brother Mike as he brings us the word. We pray, Father, that uh, you will help him to remember the things that's needful for this congregation to be a better servant to you. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. see everybody out tonight and uh, hope everybody's enjoying the weather and everything else that goes along with it are you accustomed yet to it getting darker sooner 
I'm not either. I'm not either. Yeah. It seems like our dog's not adjusted. We're not adjusted. You know, it gets darker earlier, and it's like, isn't it supper time yet? It's, it's never supper time yet when it's, when it's supposed to be. So, but if, if we stick with it, eventually we'll go back to another time, and we'll be happy with that. Tonight we're going to talk about overcoming prejudice. What are some areas in which we uh, witness prejudice today? Any ideas? Racial uh, prejudice, okay, what else? Politics, okay. Anybody else want to venture a guess or two? Okay, all right. Prejudice with children at home? Anything? Sexual prejudice, okay. What else? All right, well, let's take a look at a, at a definition here. Webster says that prejudice is a preconceived judgment or opinion. And that's good to stop right there. You know, what does it mean to be preconceived? You made up your mind before you saw it, right? So it's a preconceived judgment or opinion, an opinion or learning adverse to anything without just grounds or before sufficient knowledge, an irrational attitude of hostility directed against an individual, group, race, or their supposed characteristics. Okay, so a lot of words in there basically to mean, like you said, you've already made up your mind before you see the evidence, before you assess anything, so you were prejudging a situation. Now, is it always wrong for us to prejudge situations? No, it's not always wrong. As a matter of fact, many of us as Christians already have prejudging built into our, our whole scheme of living, right? So if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I want you to do something illegal, doesn't matter what it is, they want you to do something illegal. What is our prejudgment on doing something illegal? We're not going to do it. We're not going to do it, right? So we are prejudiced in the sense that we are prejudging certain situations, but not with respect to this definition where it says that we're doing this without grounds or before having sufficient knowledge. So we're already making a judgment as Christians before we get into a sinful situation assessed we have sufficient knowledge to know sin leads us away from God disobedience leads us away from God and losing our sobriety or any other the number of things that that help us to attain our selfish desires always uh, or often leads to going away from God so here again in this definition it uh, is the irrational attitude of hostility directed against an individual group, race, or their supposed characteristics. So as it was mentioned earlier with racial or sexual or even political prejudice, can you see where an irrational attitude of hostility sometimes can come out uh, in those areas? Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Look at the news over the last several years, and you'll find a lot of irrational hostility that's directed towards a group or an individual based on their identity or their uh, affiliation. Does that make sense? Does that make sense, right? So if we, if we saw somebody, well, and it used to be a lot simpler, right? If you went to see a Western and one guy was wearing a white hat and one guy was wearing a black hat, which one was the good guy? White the white hat. It used to be pretty simple to figure out who was who, right, and what was what. And, and, and it's amazing how, you know, you get into these shootouts in, in, in Hollywood and the bad guys, they shoot 10,000 shots and can't hit a thing, and the good guy shoots two shots, one to hit a lock and, and splinter it off, off uh, the gate and two to hit somebody else between the eyes. It's amazing, isn't it, how that works. But our preconceived notions and our prejudice often will lead us into a situation where even though we may not express it as hostility, we may be opposite a guy or a person or a concept or opposed to that, and we may be sufficiently hostile towards that position without gathering sufficient evidence. Okay? And so prejudice can come into play from time to time. Now, what do we do with this? It also says it's closed-mindedness, and judgment or condemnation before investigation, okay? 
So I wonder if any of us have ever been prejudged based on our appearance. Yeah, lots of times. Uh, Steve and I tell the story about a fellow that we had over in another church where I was at years ago. Uh, had a very nice ponytail, wore his hair in a ponytail. And uh, that wasn't the norm for that congregation. And, uh, and one of our well-meaning members who since passed on, he just couldn't contain himself one Sunday afternoon. And he says, man, we sure are glad that you and your family have been visiting with us, and we sure wish you'd go get that hair cut off before you come back, you know. Well, the hair had nothing to do with his ability to be faithful to God. But this fella had a prejudged men that wore long hair. He didn't wait to get to know the fellow, know anything about him, know what his spiritual needs were or anything, but his prejudice in that situation helped him to form this opinion and the need to express it in such a way that drove him away uh, from the church for a while. It's a sad situation. But see how prejudice and prejudging uh, situations can, can come along with that. So sometimes what we deal with, uh, we've never really been faced with having to work through it and to work to where we find the details there. So let's look at a few things here. Proverbs 18 and verse 17. I like this verse. Uh, have you ever judged too quickly? Well, all of us have. Here uh, the wise man says, The first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. Now this is a trap that oftentimes we'll find people in church falling for this trap. Elders, preachers, others, it, it doesn't matter who we are. Sometimes we'll fall for this because someone will come first and they will come loudest and they will say X, Y, Z. And so we assume since that's a brother or sister telling us X, Y, Z, that X, Y, Z is the issue exactly as it's ex expressed to us and we've got to take X, Y, Z as our position. Well, that's good until what? Until the next person comes along. And he says, ABC, not XYZ, ABC. Now what do you do? Now what do you do? And so being prejudiced is looking at a situation, prejudging without getting all the facts in together. We've known several situations throughout the years where there might be a marital problem. You know, that happens from time to time. Marriages have problems, and sometimes there's divorce, and sometimes there's uh, infidelity and finger-pointing and all kinds of things. And, and we've unfortunately, we've seen some situations where there was a prejudice to believe the man's story and not believe the woman's story, not based on the facts, but based on, the, based on their prior association just to think, well, I don't think he would ever do that, so... I don't believe your story that he did that. Well, as it turns out, he did do that. But their prejudice in looking at the situation caused them to be hostile towards his wife, not believing her, not looking to gain the information that they needed. And you come back to this verse, the first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. Okay? So we've got to be careful about how we do. And just to lighten it up a little bit, I saw a little video clip the other day, and uh, this, this woman comes home, and her dog is there, and there's a whole mess behind the dog. The Christmas tree has fallen over, and there's uh, tissue paper and things all over. And the dog looks up, and the dog is saying, I am so glad you came home. The Christmas tree just exploded. You know, well, hey. You know, that, that sounds right. You know, that sounds good until you start to investigate and think, well, now wait, that Christmas tree is not going to explode. And you're the only one that's been in this room with that Christmas tree. I think it was you, the dog, who knocked over that tree and made all that mess. So being patient, and we've talked about impatience before in this series, being, impa uh, being impatient can lead us to making mistakes because of our prejudices. So we've got to be careful. Now, does it matter if, if you've known a person for 50 years or not, whether or not that person is capable of, of sinning? Does it really matter? No. Actually, the thing is, every single one of us is capable of sinning, right? Absolutely, every single one of us. I've known preachers who have had affairs. I've, had, I've known elders who have left the church and, and, uh, and left Christianity. I've known of secretaries that embezzled uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars from the treasury, uh, all of this in the church, and all of this with people that you think, well, that would never happen. But 
hey, sin and temptation, it's around for everyone. So let's take a look uh, quickly at a few examples of prejudice in the Bible. This first one of the Pharisees in Matthew 13, verses 14 and 15. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears of heart are hard of hearing, and their eyes have, they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turns, and turn so that I should heal them. Uh, here, what Jesus is talking about is, there's going to come a point in time when he says that people are simply not going to see or to hear what the real truth is. And here again, what is truth? Right? John 17, 17, uh, what is truth? And thy word is truth, that's right. So the only real truth, absolute truth that we can go to is to appeal to the Bible. Uh, to appeal to the Bible. There's so many different versions of what is true that's being passed around in media, and, uh, and it's really sad, really, really sad that, uh, that we could be deceived in some way. But here Jesus is saying some people are just not going to listen. They're not going to see what the real truth is. It's going to be their prejudice in that situation. Why? Well, ju I'm just not going to believe that. I'm not going to believe that. You might find that with a parent who says, well, I'll never believe that my child could ever do this. Okay, well, it's all right for you to say that, I guess, but you better investigate the facts because sometimes good people have kids that aren't so good. And sometimes those kids that aren't so good today can make a total turnaround and be just fine the next day. But you, you better look at all the details and not be prejudiced in not taking in all the information. Uh, the Jews at the trial of Jesus, Matthew 27, 22 through 25. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? And they all said to him, Let him be crucified. But the governor said, "What? Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. And when Pilate saw that he, he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and our children. Okay. Now, they weren't looking at the facts of who Jesus was. Matter of fact, there were six different trials that Jesus went through during that short period of time between the time he was arrested and the time that he was crucified. Three of them were Jewish trials or examinations, and three were Roman. And none of them, none of them were legitimate. They weren't looking at the facts. There were false witnesses that were brought forth that couldn't even agree with each other. Uh, as a capital in the Jewish set, setting, uh, it was against the law for them to declare uh, the penalty of death on a person and have it carried out. Uh, under Jewish law, they were supposed to take that. If there was going to be a capital uh, 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 judgment given, they had to go home and rest on it and sleep on it and come back again and vote again on it. So none of the things that were done with Jesus were according to the law. The prejudice, though, against Jesus, just get rid of him. Just get rid of him. It's kind of politics, isn't it? Like you were saying before. And, you know, we've, we're in a deeply divided country in many different ways and uh, divided to the extent that nobody really wants to see any of the details. They just want to get rid of this or get rid of that. And I vote for get rid of all of it. <laughs> just wipe it all out. Just wipe it all out. Just give everybody a free ticket to some other country one way and uh, just clear out the whole bunch and then start all over again. That'd be fine with me. I mean, how much worse off could it be? Well, don't answer that. I don't want to know how much worse, worse off it could be. Now, the Brians, uh, the Brians were not prejudiced. They wanted to see what the details were. In Acts 17, uh, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness, and they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. So what were the, what were the Brians known for doing? Well, they were known for not taking you at, at your word. They wanted to search the scriptures and see that that was true or not. Um, we have so-called fact checkers today that will go out and somebody makes a statement and somebody else comes behind and says, this was partially true or this was totally true 
based on the facts. Well, it depends on whose facts you're using, you know, when, when that goes through. But the Bible is the ultimate fact checker on things, right? Uh, because somebody can come in and say, you know what, they passed a law in our country and in our state, and it says that I can do X, Y, and Z as often as I want to. But the Bible says X, Y, and Z is against God's law. Well, the fact is it's going to be against God's law no matter what man says in this. The Brians were able to take something that was taught to them. And they were able to open up their Bibles and to search to see if something was true or not. Now, that's important for us because there are some times that we come to a passage or we might come to a concept uh, that we don't all agree on because it's just a very difficult concept. And our prejudices, our preconceived concepts of whatever that issue is can sometimes prevent us from looking at what the Bible says about that topic. That's why it's important for us always to be open-minded, to always pray, be prayerful, and turn to God's Word for the answers that we, that we need. Because sometimes we've been taught things that aren't exactly out of the Bible. Well, so what are some of our own prejudices? Uh, how about this one? If we start using, but I think, instead of following what the Bible says. You know, well, I think this is what we ought to do. Well, what does the Bible say that we ought to do about that? Well, I think it would be better if we did this or that. Well, what does the Bible say about that? You know, I, I like to keep things really simple because it's a, a lot easier for me to keep score that way. But, uh, you know, you go back to the Sermon on the Mount and among those things about uh, praying for your enemy and, and loving uh, your enemy and stuff, Jesus also says that we ought to treat each other the way what? The way we ought to be, want to be treated. That's known as what? The golden rule. It's a good rule. It, it basically works on anything. I want to be treated, I want to treat you the way that I want to be treated myself. So when we look at that, or when we look at Matthew 18 about how you go to resolve an issue with a brother after your brother has sinned against you or offended you, Matthew 18 is pretty straightforward. It says if a brother sins against you, you go put it on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and, and call the Tennessean, right? right? No, 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 no. If your brother sins against you, talk to the elders and the gossips in the church. And no, no. What is, but I think, but I think, oh, but it's hard. You mean, you mean if somebody sins against me, I'm supposed to go only to them and tell them what they've done? That's the first step? Absolutely. And you know what? That causes so many problems when we avoid that very first step. And why do you think somebody who's been sinned against would be reluctant to go and tell that person that they did something against them? Why do you think they'd be reluctant to do that? They yeah, they may be guilty, but I mean, the person who was hurt, why do you think they're reluctant to go and tell the person that they've, they've been hurt? Yeah, they, they might not, you know, they don't want to incur more wrath. Plus, I mean, it takes a lot of courage, doesn't it, to, to go and tell somebody, hey, friend, you know, what you said really hurt me. Uh, or, or what you did you know, in this situation was really bad. That's why we need to be careful because this phrase, but I think, right? Well, I know what the Bible says. Well, I don't really care what you think. I mean, I'm going to be nicer to, than, than that to you in a, in a personal conversation, but I'm going to let you know it doesn't really matter what you or I think. It only matters what the Bible says. Only matters what the Bible says. So, if we go with, but I think, that's a good sign that we have our own prejudices built into the system. Uh, ignoring clear biblical direction is, is another thing there. And choosing our own way to settle disputes, which comes back to the Matthew 18 situation. You know, choosing our own way. Well, I just think it's better if we just keep it under wraps and just share it with a few dozen people each day. And uh, eventually, you know, that person will probably get mad and leave anyway. No, that's not the way God said for this to happen. Matter of fact, did you know the Bible says it's all right to be angry? Be angry and what? Do not sin. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Right. Boy. All right, so if I start to put these things together, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Be angry but don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on my wrath. Also, I need to go and tell the person who sinned against me that they've sinned against me. Do you get a sense of timing?
for how soon I should go tell somebody that they sinned against me? It's pretty, pretty, pretty soon. It's pretty soon according to God's ways. God's ways are always the best ways. All right, well, let's, uh, let's look at identifying prejudice in a couple of ways here. Uh, we've already looked at this uh, slide there, being irrational. Look at what Nathaniel said in John chapter 1, verses 45 and 46. Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said, Come and see. How do you think that was, uh, well, it's, it's written there at the bottom, prejudice against a region, prejudice against a region. Now, I know that none of us would ever be prejudiced against a region, right? No, no, no. I mean, you just look at Alabama and Georgia, you know. You could tell the same jokes. You just change Alabama to Georgia, and they all apply. They all point fingers back for Kentucky and Tennessee, all these types of things, right? And, and so, it, but it goes even deeper than that, see? Uh, one side of the tracks, the other side of the tracks, prejudice against the region. Uh, you might have a rival from your high school, and somebody else came from that rival's area, so there's prejudice built up in that. See, prejudice comes in all different forms. Uh, the uh, Pharisee and the publican, here's a, another example of uh, this is prejudice against a class. Uh, Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. And he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Now, that's a bad situation already. I know I'm going to heaven because I'm good enough. No, no, you're not. If you're going to heaven, it's because you're obeying God. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Well, what was, what was the Pharisee doing? He was lumping everybody together, and he was being prejudiced against them. Boy, I'm glad I'm not like those people. doesn't matter what kind of definition you have for those people. It's an us against them type situation. And it's virtually impossible to put everybody into a bucket. Did you know that? There's always somebody there that's going to not be what you think that they are. So that's prejudice against a class. Some areas of prejudice that we discussed earlier, obviously we have uh, race, uh, sex prejudice, uh, intellectual prejudice might come up, financial prejudice, how we are, if we're well-to-do or not uh, well-to-do. Um, keeping up with the Joneses, that type of thing. Uh, the occupational uh, prejudice that may come up, uh, we, we saw a lot of occupational prejudice against police and against uh, people in authority that way. Age prejudice, okay, age prejudice. Um, well, he's too young to know anything, or she's too young to know anything of how, how this is. Well, you don't know until you're in, in that situation. Have you ever noticed... How young young people seem to us the older we get. Have y'all noticed that too? I mean, like we were in high school, you know, we were able to grow mustaches and do all uh, uh, kinds of things, and, and everybody was mature looking and stuff, and now you look, and they look like sixth graders in high school, you know, graduating high school. They just all look so young. And I, I haven't had this happen too often, but, you know, when you go into the doctor's office and everybody's like really younger than you, it doesn't give me a good feeling. I mean, I'm glad, to, I'm glad to be older than they are, but it's like I've got symptoms that are older than you. I, I don't know that you know how to, how to treat me. I, don't, I want somebody old and white-headed, you know, with a 40-year-old stethoscope around his neck. You know, I don't want somebody young like this because, I, I, see, I'm prejudiced in that in a sense, right? I'm not gathering all the information. Mike? Yes. Oh, yes, yes, 
Yeah, they cleaned their language up quite a bit right, right away. Right away, yeah. Well, you know, with me it's not so much because I've been told I have preacher hair, whatever preacher hair is. And so they just kind of, and I've, got, I've gone into places before and somebody would just ask me, are you a preacher? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm a preacher. And I, I said, it must be the hair. I don't, I don't know what it is. Of course, as a policeman, I mean, you don't have to be in uniform for people to kind of figure that out. And, 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 and here again, you know, right, it doesn't matter who the person is or what the situation is. Uh, in another church where we were at, we had uh, a, a fellow who was a policeman and a wonderful fellow, but th there were some people that were prejudiced against him because, because of his profession. Uh, he had not done anything, to my knowledge, that was ever against the law or against people, treated people fairly all the time, those types of things, but the prejudice position was it's irrational, it's going to be hostile, and it's not going to wait on information to come in. They're simply going to be against a person because of race, sex, intellect, finances, their uh, occupation, their age, or their associations. And, and this is where it comes into a really difficult area for us. We're, we're told as Christians that we're supposed to live in the world but not be what? Not be of the world, right? We, we've got a choice here. Romans 12 tells us that we're to be uh, transformed into what Jesus wants us to be, not conformed or molded into what the world wants us to be. And so there are always choices for us to, to, uh, to have to go through, and, and it becomes difficult. So very quickly, let's go through a few things. But to overcome prejudice, investigate and embrace the truth. Investigate and embrace the truth. There are a lot of different uh, optical illusions that we see from time to time. And, and I'm a big fan of, of different mind games and puzzles and optical illusions. And some of these are really, really, uh, they're challenging. There might be some where there are two circles that are put up on a board, and one looks exactly smaller, I mean, definitely smaller than the other, uh, until you see a different perspective, and then you find out that they're exactly the same size. Uh, and these types of things fool us as we're looking at it. We have to investigate, and we have to measure, we have to check these things out because it doesn't make sense to us. Some things are just difficult for us to understand. But when we investigate and learn the truth, then we'll know that. And, and what is truth? John 17, 17. Thy word is truth. That's right. So somebody says something that goes against what the Bible says, but we have evidence in the Bible. What well, Friend, you need to come and investigate and embrace what the truth is. Well, nobody ever, nobody's ever been uh, in, in this situation, you know, to ascend up into heaven. Well, Acts chapter 1 tells about Jesus ascending up into heaven. So you, there's your evidence. Let's investigate this and see. Or an axe head has never, never floated on water. Well, let's go over in the Old Testament. We find out about that. And that actually was there. So let's look at a few of these passages. Uh, John 8 and verse 32. Truth is going to set us free. You shall know the truth and the truth shall, sh shall, well, shall set you free. Sorry about that. I got a little tongue tied. So how does the truth set us free? Well, I took enough business law in college to know a few things, not enough to be a lawyer, even one on TV, but enough to know, you know that, that truth should be an absolute defense. If you can prove the truth, then you can disprove a falsehood. Okay, so if you can prove a truth, you can disprove the, the falsehood. And the same principle applies with this. You shall know the truth, and the truth is going to set you free. Well, what's the truth about sin? How many people sin? All of us, right? How do you know that? The Bible says so. Romans 3.23, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. What's the penalty of sin? What's the, what's the paycheck for sin? Death. Death. How do you know that? The Bible, Bible says so. Where's that at? Romans 6.23, right? The wages of sin are death. And so you start going through these things and you, you think, well, the, the, the truth, once I know the truth, that can set me free. A lot of people look for freedom in the world apart from God, and what they find is that they're not free, but instead they're going to be entangled in something. The truth also gives life, James 1 and verse 18. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Sanctifies us also, John 17, 17, as we mentioned earlier. Sanctify them by your truth, your word, 
is truth. The truth is also going to purify us. 1 Peter 1, 22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Here again, we get some other concepts coming in to love one another is so important. The truth is also going to judge. Romans chapter 2 and verse 2. But we know that judgment of the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. Romans chapter 1, you start with about verse uh, 18 or 19 or so, read down through the first few verses of chapter 2, you get a very dim view of, of uh, humanity. All the sins and the things that are there. But God is going to judge according to truth. Uh, the we hear it when we embrace the truth, Ephesians 1.13. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed the Holy Spirit of promise. You've got to hear what the truth is. We love and believe the truth, 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 10 through 12. With all unrighteous uh, deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie and that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. A lot's been said uh, in the past few years about lies, a big lie, little lie, white lie, black lie, whatever the lie may be. Is it possible for us to believe lies? Absolutely, absolutely. Is it possible for us to be genuine? And, and sincere as we believe a lie. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Because why? Why do we believe a lie? Because we don't investigate to see what the truth is in that situation. Well, as far as the truth of Jesus, it doesn't matter what people think in their minds. The truth is not going to change. It's our job to help them embrace it. We need to also teach the truth. Ephesians 4, verses 15 and 16. But speaking the truth in love that they may grow up into all things into him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body of the edifying of itself in love. This is a part of a longer sentence, which actually goes from, from uh, chapter 4, verse 11, down through 16, all one long sentence that Paul has there. And the, the gist of that is all of these things together, including every part of the body doing its share, that's each one of us, all of that together produces the growth of the body. This is the last slide for us today. We need to live the truth. John, uh, 3 John verses 3 and 4. For I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in about his biological children. Who's he talking about? He's talking about fellow Christians there in the, in the church. He says, I have no greater joy than to hear that they are walking in truth. And finally, we correctly handle or rightly handle the truth. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved uh, to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So how do we overcome prejudice? Well, we need to recognize that prejudice is something that can happen with any of us. It's prejudging a situation, but doing so without gathering the evidence and also doing so in such a way as to be hostile or, or against something uh, irrationally. Uh, we can be prejudging situations such as I said earlier uh, about sin, illegal activities, those types of things. We prejudge those based on the evidence that God already gives us. So what we're doing is we're saying, if I'm ever faced with a situation, I know what my response will be because I know that this is what God wants me to do. That is wrong. I'm not going to do that. I've already judged that to be wrong based on what God says. But to look at a person or to look at a situation without gathering the truth and to pass judgment on it or to be hostile to it becomes prejudice in that bad sense that we've talked about. And that's what we should avoid in life. You never know who's going to walk through these doors. And you never know who we're going to engage in uh, conversation with at, at the checkout line at the store. You never know the background of the person who inadvertently bumped into your back bumper 
uh, while you're on the street. So in all of these situations, let's remember to conduct ourselves as children of God, always to be treating others as we want to be treated. And before we pass judgment on any situation, let's embrace the truth and let's follow what the truth is. David has a song of encouragement that's been selected for us tonight. If we can help you in any way, please come now while we stand and sing. Thank you, kind Father, for your many blessings. Thank you for bringing us together tonight. We do look forward to it. Father, I thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for coming down here. We needed him. Thank you for the love that you showed. Father, as we leave here, stay with us. See us home. Bring us back to time. And all things that we ask, Father, we're asking Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.